Welcome to the Elevate Podcast, conversations with women changing the face of business. And now your hosts, Christy Wallace and Maricela Carrera. Hello and welcome to the Elevate Podcast. This is your host, Christy Wallace, with my co-host, Maricela Herrera. Hi, Maricela. How are you doing today? I'm okay. I'm pretty sleepy. Oh, come on. Move and around. I- a dance party. One of our coworkers, Nazla, always uh, has a dance party to get herself up and moving in the morning. And I'm going to totally take her lead on that. I've been, I've been doing it with the girls. It's lots of fun. Oh, that sounds fun. Maybe I should do that today. Yeah. It, well, it's hard. I mean, we don't, we're not moving as much as we used to and transitioning from one place to the next. Uh, so you have to kind of build in other ways to, to get your, you know, energy up. And yeah. uh, I found that to be kind of a fun one too. Dancing is fun. Maybe we'll have to <laughs> create a playlist, you know, an elevate playlist for uh, our dance parties. That's a great idea. I think we have our mobilized women playlist. <laughs> All right. Well, we already have one then, so we'll have to tap into that. Mobilize Women is coming up. Maricel, are you so excited? I am. I am so excited. Uh, I know it's a different year. Mobilize Women, for those of you who haven't heard us talk about it, although probably all of you have heard us talk about it at some point or another, uh, it's our yearly summit. Uh, We usually host it in New York City and live stream it globally. But this year, it's a little different. Uh, we're hosting it virtually and it's a week long event or series of events. It's mobilized women week. And it really is one of my favorite things that we do. It just, it's so powerful because speakers and attendees and everyone that's in that room or well online this year is really passionate about creating a more just and equitable world. And we have thought leaders, like we have incredible speakers who you might not even know you need to know, but you need to know them. Um, and incredibly powerful points of views and conversations that will leave you a little, I almost want to say uncomfortable in a good way, in the way that really is about expanding your point of view in your mind. Yes. And, and this is, you know, such a key time in our world, in our history, in our society, around each of us taking ownership for um, expanding our minds, for learning about uh, different experiences, different identities, different situations, different biases and uh, obstacles and challenges, and the way that we as individuals can take an active role in creating a better world. I believe each one of us has a unique power and ability to make the world better. Um, I'm not just saying that. I I really, truly believe it. I've seen it firsthand um, how much impact, you know, we can have on one life, on one conversation, on one workplace, on one family. So lots of great things come out of Mobilize Women. I encourage you to join us for this really important conversation that will be taking place at multiple times throughout the week with different speakers and perspectives. And speaking of impact and change, our guest today is is someone I admire to such a degree, Nina Ansari. I met her initially through UN Women. She's a big leader and change maker. Uh, she's doing so much to advocate uh, for women and for a better world. Her insights and perspectives uh, just always brought in my mind and helped me to think about things in new and unique ways. And she is um, a great guest on our podcast today. Yeah, talk about a change maker. She is, she's wonderful. She's quite the powerhouse. Yes, she is. And she recently came out with a book called Anonymous as a Woman. And it's really looking at how the telling and shaping of history has uh, eliminated many identities and has really created a lot of, you know, lack of awareness and bias in our society. It's a powerful book, but I think incredibly relevant during this time as we all look at, you know, the history that we've learned and, and the ways in which 
we need to re-examine that and re-examine that in a way to move forward uh, and to create more equity, more equality and change in this world. So please enjoy my conversation with Nina and we'll get to it now. Nina, thank you so much for joining us today on the Elevate podcast. It has been such an honor getting to know you, uh, specifically through your work at UN Women, but more broadly through a lot of the important work you're doing around uh, equality and women's rights. And I cannot wait to get into what I know will be a really important conversation around these issues. But I wanted to start first uh, just by welcoming you to the podcast and asking you to share a little bit about your story, um, which I know has such an impact on the work that you do today. So if you wouldn't mind telling us a little bit about you and and how you got to where you are today. Hi, Christy. Thank you so much for that lovely introduction. And thank you for having me and for the opportunity to talk about my work. I was born in Iran, pre-revolution Iran, and left at the cusp of the 1979 revolution and have not returned since. What prompted my work specifically on women's issues was I went back to Columbia University um, late in life. I was 40 years old and decided to get my PhD, which, as you know, in the States is a seven to nine year process. And I wrote my thesis specifically on the history of the women's rights movement in Iran and how that. Uh, has translated in a post-revolutionary period where despite all the discriminatory policies against women that have been essentially embedded not only into the fabric of society, but also into the Islamic constitution, how women are uh, fighting a, a uh, an uphill battle and making strides, suffering setbacks, but the importance of their resilience, their courage, and their peaceful activism really uh, was the catalyst for my work. And that has evolved over the years into more of a global landscape. And that came to the surface with my work with UN Women and also as a visiting fellow at the London School of Economics Center for Women, Peace and Security. So Nina, with your first book, Jewels of Allah, The Untold Story of Women in Iran, and, and it really focused on the women's movement in Iran, how how did you go about uh, the process for, for writing that book? And how are you able to, now living in the United States, really connect with that community and with uh, the, the experiences of women in Iran? Well, that was exactly one of the biggest challenges because unable to go back to Iran for numerous reasons. I had a gentleman who was able to get out numerous um, copies of women's various women's publications in addition to the elementary school system curriculum, specifically um, grades one through six, as I had to do in-depth studies of what a post-revolutionary cultural revolution that in essence Islamicized a once modernized nation was disseminating through the education system, through its to, through various mediums, what kind of a message it was imparting to a new generation of women who were born and raised within this patriarchal environment, and what effectively led to a generation that by and large doesn't subscribe to the ideology propagated by the current regime. When I see a lot of connections there with the conversations that have been happening in the United States, you know, what is the, the framing of history? What are the stories that we're telling and how does that impact uh, this next generation of leaders and and voters and citizens um, in terms of how they see the history, um, particularly the history as it pertains to the rights of women, the rights of people of color and underserved populations. Uh, what what are you seeing in the United States? Like, where do we stand, and and what what do we need to be looking at more deeply during this time? Christy, this is a really important question 
Thank you for asking that. You know, as we just touched on, my work, which began with women in Iran and their um, uphill battle uh, and fighting the gender discriminatory laws, over the years, my combination of my lectures and participation on various panels from conferences to universities, in addition to my advocacy work with UN Women and my academic work with the London School of Economics, basically uh, translated into exploring the history of systemic gender oppression. And I always felt that there's a sense that women in developing countries face more daunting challenges, but that women in developed countries and progressive countries like the UK and US are pretty much dealing with an equal opportunity society. And when you look at the current global statistics, when you specifically look at the global gender gap index where the US is concerned, that is not exactly accurate. So the difference is, if you're dealing with a country like Iran, the discriminatory laws and policies, as I mentioned, are embedded in the constitution. They're very black and white. They're very apparent. What we're dealing with in the US is a lot of uh, discriminatory stereotypical practices that continue to hold women and girls back from achieving their full potential. And the, when we look at the statistics, specifically the Global Gender Gap Index, we realize um, although we have made tremendous progress, there is still a long road ahead. And I always feel when you provide statistics, provide a visual data, it, it really um, magnifies what we're dealing with. So if you want me to give you uh, some examples of where we're at here in the U.S. and the challenges women face is when you look at the um, Global Gender Gap Index, which is studied annually by the World Economic Forum, specifically countries' rankings in, the, in terms of economic participation and opportunity, educational attainment, health and survival, and political empowerment. Each year, the World Economic Forum <clears throat> presents this study. And out of the 144 countries assessed last year, the US came in at 51, just to give you a glimpse. And what's even more alarming is how the U.S. has fallen 23 places since 2015. And you compare this to the countries that uh, rank at the top of the list, which is Norway, Sweden, Finland, Nicaragua, Rwanda, and New Zealand. The U.K. comes in at 15th, just above Canada. And then we look at the U.S., which really is not, and I don't know about you, I was pretty much stunned when I came across this statistic to begin with. So then you start to dissect the layers and you look at the U.S. in terms of, you know, where women stand in the workplace, where women stand in the political field. Um, and you realize how uh, the low representation of women in leadership positions um, the workplace specifically, as I know you're well aware, the equal opportunities, uh, equal pay, paid maternity leave are some of the top issues that women here in the U.S. are forced to contend with. Yeah, I mean, it's, it is startling. I, I, you know, I've heard these statistics and yet every time I hear them, I, I just, I cringe. And a question for you about, you know, I'm really interested in, the U.S. moving back in the rankings. And my guess, uh, although I'm sure you have more insight into this, is that that's in large part due to the progress that other places are making and, and their ability to really move the needle when it comes to equality. What are some of the practices that you've seen that are working in you know places like Norway, for example, and Sweden? Okay, so that's, that's a great question. Um, so if you look at the uh, Nordic countries specifically, let's take as a template Iceland, Norway, and Sweden, for example. Why is it that they continuously lead in terms of closing the gender gap? Well, if I had a couple of days, we could go into all the 
the details of what they have implemented and embedded in their society to be able to rank um, at the top. But here, broadly, some of the reasons. One, they make it possible for parents to combine work and family. Two, um, the majority of Nordic countries offer shared paid parental leave. And if we look at the U.S. in terms of specifically our lack of care infrastructure, uh, that's a huge, huge problem. And I'm sure as a working mother, you're well aware of the fact that U.S. is the only advanced economy that does not have paid maternity leave. So mothers in the U.S. face a unique set of obstacles because the U.S. is actually the only advanced economies where mothers are entitled to zero weeks of paid maternity leave under federal law. And as of 2019, only six states have passed paid family leave. Yes, all of this is just, you know, resonating and and is so true. And I think, you know, more than ever, the current climate that we live in, the current time with COVID-19 has has really made a lot of these inequalities, these lack of systems more more evident, uh, the impact it has. For example, you know, on one hand, there's been an argument that uh, people sheltering in place and working from home has helped to normalize that working parent mindset. But on the other hand, as companies start to open back up and yet schools and camps and daycare centers are not, you are now faced with a really difficult discussion around how parents can go back to work when their children are home. Conversely, you know, the amount of work that in an unequal division of labor in the home around caregiving and trying to work at the same time. So it's it's very nuanced and complicated, but I would love to hear you know, anecdotally, some of the things you've been hearing during this time, specifically around the impact of, of women. Look, so Christy, we can look at the pandemic as potentially a time and an opportunity to up the bar, so to speak, in terms of raising awareness around such issues. Um, so meaning you're looking at overall 40 million people are unemployed. And these unemployment levels are really approaching those of the Great Depression. And in my work, I have chronicled centuries of gender disparity, both in Iran and in the global community. And pre-pandemic world was one where um, there was wage discrimination, professional and legal barriers embedded in society that really continued to keep approximately half of the world's population from achieving their full potential. And at the same time, you were dealing with racial, ethnic, and socioeconomic discrimination, which also created strong barriers for not only Black women, Hispanic women, but also countless minority men as well. Then you have a pre-pandemic world, which is really uh, magnified in many ways all the problems we were dealing with pre-pandemic, meaning the pandemic has only magnified the disparities. And some of the um, issues here are industries typically dominated by women, such as hospitality, leisure, healthcare, have all been hit the hardest. For example, in April, just uh, women's unemployment rate reached 16.2%. That's 3% higher than men. And so women are losing jobs at a disproportionate rate. So for example, despite holding 77% of jobs in the education and health services, women accounted for 83% of jobs lost. And these statistics are even more grim for black and Hispanic women. Why? Because women make up majority of low wage workers, cashiers, receptionists, teachers, aides, and they've been the first to go. And you're dealing, again, like you mentioned, these problems are layered and more intricate. So you take that a step further and you talk about, and you have to address issues of working mothers coping with a lack of childcare now and the added pressure of homeschooling. You take it a step further. 
you need to look at single mothers, the majority of which face daunting challenges. So here there's an opportunity to potentially starting over and by starting over and the path forward, I mean not to press the restart button, but in many ways to start over in order to hopefully shape positive outcomes and address these issues that have been simmering for a long time and creating so many obstacles for women across the board in a way that's more conducive to a post-pandemic uh, world. Nina, what are your thoughts on, on how we start over? You know, where, where do we go from here? What are the steps we should take? Okay, so one of the issues that I continuously, uh, you know, I speak to so many women, as I mentioned, one is through social media, on my social media platform, a lot of women and young girls specifically reach out to me, conferences, panels, I get the opportunity to talk to so many women, not just in the US, not but specifically in the UK, where I work as well. Let's, you know, there's, as I said, these problems are layered, there's so many. So given the interest of time, let's deal with wage discrimination, if that's okay with you. So in the US, what we're dealing with currently is women with equal work experience, equal education to their male counterparts receive between, earn between five to 20% less, right, than men. So how do we address this? We, you know, to eliminate the gender gap. Well, you look at companies, this is something that's possible if the effort and time and resources are put into play. Um, I'll give you two examples of companies that were successful in doing that in the past, recent past. One was Salesforce. I don't know if you're familiar with them. A couple of years ago, they invested $6 million to close the gender pay gap within their own company. And then Starbucks recently reached 100% pay equity, but it was a 10-year process for them. So meaning these companies um, serve as inspiration, serve as example, and also show that it is possible to close the gender pay gap, correct? So the discrimination women face uh, earning, you know, Another statistic, which is grim again, is we have this general perception that women in the U.S. receive approximately 82 cents to the dollar for 82 cents for every dollar a man earns. That's actually incorrect. It's more like 42 percent on the average. So, uh, you know, that's one way uh, to help women in a post pandemic period, specifically given how they have been disproportionately, again, impacted along with, you know, it's not just white women, it's black women, it's Hispanic women. So how can we uh, push towards shaping positive outcomes? Uh, it should be the focus. And again, these uh, issues are multi-layered and not that easy to get through. And I always say the gender gap in any area uh, will not close without targeted action. You know, you, you talk about how we need to start, you know, almost at, at the beginning, right? How we form opinions and, and biases. And, you know, part of that comes from our families, but part of it comes from the, the way that we learn. And you wrote Anonymous as a Woman, uh, which I, I, is, is one of my favorite reads and a really powerful one, um, to, to really you know, challenge this head on and to tell those stories and to reframe the the history and the way that, that we're learning the, you know, challenging those biases. So what was that, you know, I, I just would love to hear, you know, what, what that has meant for you. One is paying an homage to so many notable women throughout our collective history that have made significant accomplishments yet remain obscure figures. The importance of bringing them out of anonymity. Again, the women I profiled uh, represent a mere fraction of those deserving acclaim that have been ignored. Uh, and the repercussions of ignoring these names in our, in, in, and as I mentioned, from a historical perspective, and in terms of providing uh, proper role models for the next generation, 
Uh, and then you look at the statistics, the global statistics, and that really illuminates what we're up against. I'll give you a few facts. And, you know, some people ask me, this is the 21st century. Is this really necessary? Well, you know, if you take together the sum as a whole, right? So just a few facts, over 2.7 billion women are still legally barred from having the same choice as its men. Women are only given three quarters of the legal rights that men enjoy. What is this? These two statistics alone translate into, it literally means it constrains the ability of women to get jobs. It means it constrains the ability of women to start businesses, as well as make economic decisions that are best for them and their families. So the point of the book was to put forth centuries of discriminatory laws, policies, and practices that continue to hold women and girls back in the 21st century. But part and parcel of that narrative is, yes, you're talking about, of course, the ethical and moral uh, reason why women and girls should be given equal opportunities. And then you look at um, what we are obstructing, which is our collective potential. And I know you and I have done work in the past, and your work touches on this as well, of the benefits of diversity and inclusivity, specifically in the workplace, what uh, women bring to the workplace, what women of color bring to the workplace, what minorities bring to the workplace, and how studies, numerous studies and research testify to the benefits of having diversity in our workplace, diversity in society, because solving complex taxes um, has been shown to be more effective when you have diverse teams. So yes, there is the ethical and moral argument for equality across the board, um, but you also have to address those unfortunately and prove that it is beneficial to society over and above the moral and ethical landscape. Um, the difficult thing is you have countries in which the stat, like Iran, the status of women as second class citizens has been codified into law. And then you have other countries like the US, where some of the discrimination that's taking place is, and I hate to use this word, but I don't see a way around it. It takes on a more insidious form, which manifests in claims that women are less biologically qualified, for example, in areas such as math and science. Is that true? No. Why? Uh, but it does manifest. If you look at the STEM fields, women in America comprise less than 25% of the STEM workforce. Many of the women who enter these fields, 32% specifically end up leaving their jobs after the first year. Why? Some of the reasons cited is it's a male dominated interest industry and that none of their contributions are ever valued or, or heard. Uh, the other is lack of mentorship and uh, just a lack of women in that industry. So here you have a revolving door of the STEM fields in which women have low representation and the perception becomes it's because they're not biologically qualified, which as I'm sure you remember a few years ago, a Google engineer actually said that. Um, we also have a former uh, president of Harvard, Larry Summers, who said that. So, you know, these are, you can change uh, policies, you can change laws, but it's very difficult to change stereotypical biases. Nina, thank you so much for a wonderful conversation today. I can't tell you how much I enjoyed this, as I always do when we get together. But I wanted to end with a little bit more about you. Uh, who is Nina? What are some things that really make you who you are? Uh, and we love to do this lightning round where I'm going to ask you some questions, and it would be great if you could answer in one sentence or less. So we'll get started. Is that okay with you? Of course, I'd love to. Thank you. Nina, are you introverted or extroverted? Um, I think I'm more of an ambivert. I, that's a blend of both traits. It also depends on what I'm doing. If I'm in public, I tend to be more extroverted with um, 
uh, people I meet in my private settings, if I don't know them very well, I tend to be guarded initially. So I, I try to take a middle of the road approach in terms of my personality. I love that. I, I think so many of us are a combination of, of different um, degrees of introvert and extrovert. And so I really appreciate your thoughtfulness with that. What is your favorite day of the week? Friday. <laughs> uh, I just always look forward to Fridays because it allows me to reflect back on my week and what things I was able to do and what's pending. And then I get the weekend to reflect on how to manage my time better once Monday starts rolling. Perfect. Are you an early bird or a night owl? Definitely early bird. How are, how early do you get up really early? Very uh, between five thirty and six. I'm just more um, uh, productive early morning as opposed to late at night. I just feel I get more done between the hours of six a.m. and twelve noon. Although I do work through the day, I'm most impactful with in terms of what I get done first thing in the morning. I feel it takes me longer to get through the same amount of work as uh, if I wait for the afternoon, evening portion. Yeah, I'm definitely more of a morning person too. So I, I hear you there. What is, uh, who would be your dream dinner guest? I would love to have dinner with Elizabeth Freeman, um, who, as you I'm sure know, was the first enslaved African American woman to file and win a freedom suit in Massachusetts. Well, wow, she's an amazing lady and um, her profound courage and belief in her inalienable rights really has had ripple effects throughout history, more so probably today more than ever. Nina, what is your pet peeve? Number one pet peeve is disrespectful people and people who have a lack of courtesy, basic courtesy. I always feel that courtesy is a two-way street and should be a given. And when people fall short of that, it really bothers me. What is your morning, Monday morning must have? So coffee, drink, activity, what, what helps you start your week? Well, definitely meditation and followed by coffee. <laughs> Do you have a favorite type of coffee? Uh, just, uh, organic, uh, fine grind, regular coffee from whole food. All right. I very basic. And I just add a little bit of, um, almond milk. Delicious. And you? <laughs> I, yeah, a fair trade coffee. Um, we are very fortunate in Brooklyn to have some great local coffee shops as well. Uh, so I tend to buy my beans from one of the local coffee shops and I, I drink it black, but I love coffee. It is certainly a, um, a favorite beverage of mine. Me, mine too. First thing in the morning, I actually look forward to it. I know the smell. That's so good. <laughs> uh, Nina, what is your favorite recent read? Uh, I recently read a book that was recommended by my daughter, and I honestly couldn't put it down. It was called Three Women by Lisa Tadeo. I don't know if you've heard of it. It follows the lives of three women, although she has given each of them pseudonyms. It's a fascinating look at uh, very diverse women and um, the challenges they confront in their personal lives and relationships as women. I have heard you wonderful things about that book down. and I have not read it. So I just <laughs> yeah. wrote it down. I'm going to, that is next. I'm almost finished the, my current book. So I'm, I'm going to move on to that. And finally, what is one thought you'd like to leave with our listeners today? Um, I, the only thought I want to really emphasize today is that, you know, we all have choices in life. And uh, I think, more so now than ever, it's important for each and every one of us to contribute in a meaningful way, uh, even if it's in the smallest way possible. And I don't think it's really an option today for anyone to remain silent in the face of 
any kind of injustice, I think we all have a collective responsibility to speak out because only then um, can we hope to affect meaningful change. That is a, that is a, a really powerful and important final thought, Nina. And thank you for that. And thank you for everything you've shared with us today on the podcast. It's really wonderful. Thank you for the opportunity and always a pleasure to speak to you. Thanks so much for listening to Elevate. If you like what you hear, help a girl out. Subscribe to the Elevate podcast on iTunes. Give us five stars and share your review. Also, don't forget to follow us on Twitter at Elevate NTWK. That's Elevate Network. And become a member. You can learn all about membership and all the great things that Elevate Network is doing at our website, www.elevatenetwork.com. That's E-L-L-E-V-A-T-E network.com. And special thanks to our producer, Catherine Heller. She rocks. And to our voiceover artist, Rachel Griesinger, thanks so much and join us next week.